Good morning. That was loud. Thank you for braving the the rainy Saturday morning and coming on out for another Science on Saturday lecture. Last week, we had to take a week off. I know some of you know this already, but PPL hosts what's called the United States Department of Energy Science Bowl. And so last Saturday, we had high school teams from around the state and a few from Pennsylvania here for a round robin competition, but it wasn't basketball, it wasn't football, it wasn't baseball, it was science. And it was just a wonderful, beautiful thing to see. And West Windsor Plainsboro North High School won this competition. And they will go to Washington. Yeah, there you go for the West Windsor Plainsboro folks. They are going to um, Washington, D.C. in about a month to compete against 49 other teams to become National Science Bowl champions. So we'll see what happened. Friday, so uh, last Friday during the day, we did the middle school competition. So same thing, middle school, so this is 6th, 7th, and 8th graders. And I can tell you that it was amazing because I'm reading these questions to these, these students. And by the time I finished reading the question and my brain is slowly trying to comprehend what the question even was, they're already buzzing in with the answer. Just remarkable. Same thing. Princeton Charter School won for the second year in a row. All right? And they're going to Washington, D.C. as well. So, so that's why we had to take a week off. But we are back. So thank you so much for coming out. Uh, I was late today. And there wasn't a bagel or a donut to be found. So we're going to have to order more. That's the only reason why I come in, by the way. Um, <laughs> I, everybody should know this by now. But uh, of course, you know, masks are optional. We always monitor local health conditions. Uh, if anything changed, we, of course, would let you know ahead of time. Uh, we'll, we ask that you hold the questions to the end. And we will pass microphones around so that we can all hear each other here, but also because of our our colleagues uh, and audience members who are on Zoom can hear as well. And if anyone on Zoom who's listening to my voice wants to ask a question, just use the raise hand function and we will unmute you. Okay, so I've been looking forward to this talk for since the beginning. Anytime there is a big, big result in fusion energy, it makes newspapers, not just around the country, but around the world. And then I know that my family, my friends all say to me, is that it? Are we here? Mm -hmm. Right? So Dave, are we, are we ready? Is fusion Almost. ready? Almost. Almost. Fusion, energy sources of the future. Yep. Always yep. has been. <laughs> Always will <Right>. be. <laughs> We're closer. We're we are so much closer. Yes. Dr. Dave Schlossberg is an experimental physicist at the National Ignition Facility out in California. He flew here from California to give this talk today, and we are so very appreciative of Thank that. You. My honor. He has interest in diagnostics, understanding physical phenomena as part of the implosions and stagnation group. That's really an interesting title. Implosions, yeah. I get. Stagnation, I guess we're going to find out. Mm -hmm. uh, he uses signatures from nuclear diagnostics to understand performance degradations caused by low-mode drive asymmetries in inertial confinement fusion. Say that three times fast. <laughs> and is developing next-generation nuclear diagnostics as NIF moves into a new burning plasma regime. Would you please welcome Dr. Dave Schlossberg? Oh, thank you so much. So having flown in from California, yep. um, I have to ask you three questions to get started, but it does mean that it's 6.30 in the morning for you. I am aware. Yes. Yes. So, <laughs> right. Lots of caffeine. Um, so how about, let's start off by sharing with the audience. Uh, when did you personally get interested in science for the first time? Oh, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I think, so I, I, when I went to undergrad, I knew that I wanted to do either science, physics or engineering or English or philosophy or sociology or religion or poli sci. And so for all the students in the audience, you don't need to know what you're gonna do for the rest of your life. Um, I, I still don't. Um, but when I was in undergrad, um, I actually had the opportunity to do a national undergraduate fellowship in plasma physics. And I came to Princeton. It was in this auditorium, probably two decades ago now, um, and the people here were so passionate about fusion, 
about um, at the time the tokamaks that were being um, developed and produced. And it really opened my eyes to the fact that, hey, here's a field where there's so much interesting work going on. It's accessible. Um, it's a mix of all the different science disciplines and it's societally, societally relevant, right? So there's a, there's a benefit to society for doing this, this, um, this investigation. And so that was kind of how I started into the whole fusion plasma physics realm. So in this auditorium, yeah. at some level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so how about a teacher from kindergarten, preschool, on up through grad school that was influential for you? Okay, um, I think I'll give you two teachers. How about that? Two for one. Um, one teacher was um, in high school, a uh, high school physics teacher, and he was just so passionate about physics. Um, I remember him standing on the desk saying, physics is everything, right? And so it's kind of how the world works. And so he really um, made kind of it interesting and engaging. Um, and the other teacher is my mom, who was a high school history teacher. And I think she really instilled in myself and my sister, who's here, um, kind of the joy of learning and um, your appreciation of understanding and kind of investigating something and kind of learning from both the past and the present. So, And last question. So when you are not doing research on NIF or anything else related, what's something you enjoy doing for fun, a hobby, a passion? So, so in grad school, uh, you know how it is writing a thesis. You're, you're at a keyboard all day and it's Kind of stressful and so i i decided i'm going to try kendo which i don't know if folks know but it's a japanese martial art with the sword and the face masks and what a stress relief that is after writing a thesis all day <laughs> so i i continue to do martial arts now as a, as a hobby and it's still a great stress relief in the middle of the day to go and you know do something completely different than physics and, and this kind of science stuff so well, thank you so today we get to hear the remarkable story of fusion ignition at the National Ignition Facility with Dr. Dave Schlossberg. All right, thanks so much. All right. Thanks so much for that introduction. I am thrilled today to be here to talk about something I'm passionate about, um, and that's the story of fusion ignition on the National Ignition Facility. Uh, I'm gonna try to go to full screen. I guess that's as full as it gets. So um, I'm here talking about the research, but I wanna um, basically say that I'm really here on behalf of a whole global team of people who are making ignition possible. And in that, um, in that same sense, let's see here. Oops. One second. There we go. Here's a view of, of some of the folks I work with at the National Ignition Facility. Um, some of the people who are are making helping helping make this possible. In the back, we have the experimental hall, and these are some of the folks who help make things happen. And, and really though, it's it's a much broader effort. And on the right are some collaborators that the National Ignition Facility collaborates with, um, both national laboratories in the United States, Sandia and Los Alamos National Laboratory, national laboratories abroad, um, CEA in France and AWE in England. Um, there's university participants and collaborators, University of Rochester, Princeton Plaza Physics Laboratory, um, MIT. And then there's also industry that helps um, support this effort. And so really it's a worldwide effort um, that is in large part funded by the National Nuclear Security Administration. And what I'm showing here are people who work on this project now, but really this has been a decades long project. And so we're standing on the shoulders of people who came before for 60 plus years that really helped make this moment possible. And so um, I'm, I'm thrilled today to be here to talk about that. So. What are we gonna talk about? Well, there's five key takeaways from this talk. If you remember anything about from this talk, here are the five questions. First thing is, what are the missions of the National Ignition Facility? We're gonna talk about that. What does laser stand for? And how does one work? What equation explains thermonuclear fusion? I know it sounds hard, but trust me, you'll get it. How does inertial confinement fusion work? And then what's remarkable about fusion ignition on the NIF? 
Now, if there are students in the audience, I'm going to come back to these. So you pay attention. At the end of the talk, we're going to, we're going to turn this around and ask you these. So watch out. So this is an image of the National Ignition Facility. Um, it houses the world's largest and most energetic laser. In fact, it's 192 lasers that are focused, aligned, and then amplified up more than a billion times, and then focused onto a, a target about the size of a pencil eraser. That target gets compressed at a million miles an hour and then undergoes thermonuclear fusion. And that's what we're gonna talk about today and understand that process and, and what the details of that and the physics underlying it. So let's jump in. We're gonna go through a whirlwind tour of one of the experiments on the NIF, and we'll, I'll talk about what's going on, and then we'll understand it throughout the rest of this talk. So, shot director, ready for shot. Starting countdown for shot on my mark. Three, two, one, mark. Clock is running. Five, four, three, two, one, shot. And what we're looking at here is that program that we talked about with the top-down view. Overall, it has to be about a mile of distance um, as it transmits. What we're looking at is the representation of the user. Light travels about a foot per minute. Focus is 20 foot long. 20 foot long. We were told. It tells the size of your head. There's 192 of them. You can see the picture. We're going to have a the and the 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 that capsule is just compressed very rapidly, and then you have thermonuclear fusion. And so we're going to talk about that today. That's the, that's the subject of this talk. And we're going to understand in parts what each of those um, components and what goes into that today. So from a big scale, you know, what why are we doing this? What's the purpose of the National Ignition Facility? It's a multi-billion dollar facility. It's paid for in large part by taxes. Why do we do this? Well, the National Ignition, Faci Ignition Facility conducts what's called mission-driven science. And that means that the investigations we do are for a purpose. Oftentimes it's to serve the needs of the nation, whether it's security or energy or other issues. And three of those missions of the National Ignition Facility include stockpile stewardship, discovery science, and achieving ignition through inertial confinement fusion. And I like to make these things participatory. So surprise, I'm gonna ask you questions. Anybody know what stockpile stewardship is? What does that refer to? And I'll, I'll give preference to the, some of the early career or young folks in the audience, but yes, go ahead. Yep. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So part of it is for like storage. Uh, there is some storage components of it. Um, stockpile stewardship oftentimes is to ensure safe and reliable nuclear deterrent without underground testing. So for better or worse, we have nuclear weapons. We, that cat's out of the bag. We can't put it back in. Probably saw Oppenheimer this, this past year. There's a lot of issues and implications from that development. The U.S. has a stockpile of nuclear weapons from earlier in the 20th century. And in the early 90s, we agreed, OK, we can't test these underground anymore. But heaven forbid, if we ever need to use them, we need them to work every time, all the time, no questions asked. 
So if you have a car that's 50 years old and you can't turn it on, but when you need to turn it on, it needs to run every time, all the time, how do you ensure that? Well, you can build a facility like the National Mission Facility to test the physics and the engineering of those at small scale to try to understand what's going on, understand how things age. And so one of the missions of the National Mission Facility is what's called stockpile stewardship. A second mission of the National Mission Facility is discovery science. And discovery science um, investigates the most extreme conditions in the universe. And this is, I think, some of the most fun research that's done uh, on the NIF. And so if you wanna, if you're interested in supernova explosions, so out in the universe, you have stars that explode. You can study the shock waves that come off of those stars. Ooh, that's loud. Let me see if I can adjust this. You can study the shock waves that come off of those stars on the National Mission Facility. And you can replicate those conditions in small scale in that target chamber we just looked at. You want to learn about how elements are created in stellar plasmas as elements are born and um, you can create heavier elements. Yeah, we're doing that next Tuesday. Come by, we're doing an experiment. And then, you know, we can also investigate planetary interiors. If you want to investigate how the core of Jupiter, a super heavy gas giant, um, behaves, you can replicate those pressures and conditions at the National Mission Facility. And so another mission of the NIF is to perform discovery, basic discovery science. And then a third mission of NIF is to achieve ignition through inertial confinement fusion. And that's what we're gonna focus on today. And so I've listed just a couple of the parameters that go into these kinds of experiments. Um, we we um, work with matter that gets up to temperatures of 100 million degrees. That's hotter than the, the core of the sun. We drive those experiments with radiation, the x-rays that we saw, that are three and a half million degrees. The densities of the plasmas that we make, it's different than uh, magnetic confinement, some folks are familiar with that, but the densities are 10 to 100 times denser than lead, solid lead. And the pressures are 10 to the 11th atmospheres. So it's 100 trillion times atmospheric pressure. Yeah, so we have this burning thing that's hotter than the temperature of the sun, denser than lead, and lasts for 100 trillionth of a second. And we get to measure it and create a little star on Earth. And so that's part of the mission of achieving a mission is to understand those extreme um, conditions and parameter space. So let's walk through kind of that video that we just saw and try to understand the science behind it. So what's a laser? Laser is an acronym. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. It, yes, it uses electricity and it emits light. And it, there's a, it's a special kind of light. Okay, yes. Round two, Vis it, can, it can be visible light, yes. Or ultraviolet, yes. Anybody else? Yes, okay, yes. Yes, coherent light, right. So what does that mean? That means that the wavelengths of the light are all oscillating in the same um, phase. And in fact, laser is an acronym. It stands for light, amplified amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. And one of the things about science that I like is that oftentimes the names of things describe how they work. So we can break down laser by looking at different parts of this. So stimulated emission, what does that mean? Well, say you have an atom and that atom has a nucleus and electrons whipping around it. If you excite or stimulate that electron, it raises up into a metastable energy state. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. And then what is it? Yes. All right. Well, all right. Let me take off my mic. Here you go. You want to just Fantastic. Okay. He's he's in the graduate program. Don't worry. It's fine. <laughs> Thank you, I really appreciate the participation. Yes, exactly, right. So the electron decays to the ground state, emits a photon. If you happen to have another photon coming through that is at that um, atom, right when it emits that photon as it decays, it adds to the photon you started with. So you have two, say. 
If you have a crystal full of these atoms, then you can amplify the initial light by stimulating the emission of these atoms and, um, and getting more light or radiation out. And so that's the process oops, of, of light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation, right? So we're amplifying the light by stimulating the emission of this uh, material. And that's what we saw in this movie a minute ago, right? We saw these laser beams bouncing back and forth in this beam line. And in fact, these bright areas um, that the beams pass through, those are crystals that contain those atoms. And those atoms are a very special kind of doped material. It's, in this case, it's neodymium glass. And it contains a very um, unique energy level that releases a photon at just the wavelength we want. And so every time these things pass through those bright crystals, they get amplified up more and more and more by light amplification, by stimulated emission radiation. And that's what a laser is. So now let's move on to nuclear fusion. Nuclear fusion is the process that powers stars and creates heavy elements. Now here's another question, true or false, and don't shout it out yet, but true, I'm gonna ask the whole audience this time, true or false, people in the audience have seen a working nuclear fusion reactor that provides energy to Earth this morning, before you came. True or false? Do you think it's true? Okay, who thinks it's true? Raise your hand, okay. Who thinks it's false? Okay, the trues have it. Who, okay, uh, did, did you say it was true? Somebody who said it was true? Cloudy. It was, it was cloud. yes, it was cloudy though. Fine or true. Yes, our sun. Our sun is a giant fusion reactor. And it's one, it's about one trillion meters in diameter. And um, it's five billion years old, and it's a nuclear reactor. And in fact, nearly all the energy that's radiated to Earth from the sun is produced via nuclear fusion. A byproduct of fusion is heavier elements. We'll talk about this in a minute, but fusion takes light elements and creates heavy elements. And you may have heard anecdotally, people say, oh, humans are stardust. Well, in fact, fusion produces carbon and carbon is what we're made of. We're carbon-based life form. And so we all are byproducts of stars, right? And for decades, we've worked to harness fusion power on earth. So we've talked about kind of examples of fusion. I've, I've shown you what it, how to kind of set it up and configure it. What is fusion? What, this is a good question for the audience. Who, who can tell me what fusion is? I'm good. No, it's good, it's good. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna see if anybody else wants to answer. If no one else does, I'll come back to you. Somebody else in the audience, what's fusion? I saw one hand almost go up. Yeah, yes. Yes, that's exactly right. Yep, as you said, it's when you have atoms that combine together um, to make a heavier atom and it gives off energy. And so just as you said, during nuclear fusion, two or more nuclei combine to form different nuclei and particles. And we can look at that graphically, right? So here's an example of two isotopes of hydrogen. Um, some people call them doodles and trudels, but here we're calling them deuterium and tritium. And deuterium is an isotope with a proton and a neutron. And tritium is an isotope with one proton and two neutrons. And that happens to be the fusion fuel that we use at the National Ignition Facility. These two isotopes combine together. And after fusing, they produce helium and a neutron. And in addition to those byproducts, we also get out energy. And where does the energy come from? So, so here's, a, I'm gonna test your powers of observation. On the previous slides, I showed the masses of the inputs and the outputs. And I'm gonna ask the audience, were the inputs heavier than the outputs? Were the inputs equal in mass to the out, um, outputs? Or were the outputs heavier than the inputs? First one, inputs heavier than the outputs. Raise your hand. Okay. Inputs equal in mass to the outputs. 
outputs heavier than the inputs? I don't want to vote. I just want to hear the answer. Okay. <laughs> Great. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, the inputs were heavier than the outputs. And so where does that mass go when you undergo fusion? Where does that, you know, conservation of mass, we say, okay, hey, there's a mass deficit here of about three times 10 to the minus 29 kilograms. Where does that mass go? Is there an equation that people know that explains, yes, right? Okay. That mat relates mass and energy. I think people, yes. You got it. E equals mz squared. And what's what's C? Speed of light. Yep. So when you take a little bit of mass and you multiply it by C, which is very large, multiply by C again, you get on an appreciable amount of energy. And that's the equation that governs fusion, right? So fusion takes some mass, um, multiplied by speed of light, multiplied by speed of light, and converts it to energy. And we can do a real world example. This is one of the few math calculations in the in this talk, but this is the mass deficit from DT fusion, deuterium tritium fusion. Multiply it by the speed of light squared. And in fact, you get a kind of a small amount of energy. It's two times 10 to the minus 12 joules. But remember the size scale of the sun. You know, it's a trillion meters in diameter. So in fact, in the sun, there's about 10 to the 38 reactions per second occurring in the sun. That's about two times 10 to the 26 watts of power. In fact, that's a million, billion, trillion, 100 watt light bulbs, put that into context. So it's an incredible amount of power, right? And, and on the National Mission Facility, we're creating a small fraction of that, but the idea is similar. We have a very small scale reaction. You have many of those reactions and you produce energy. And that's the idea behind fusion energy is to harness this process and extract the energy that comes out of that. You may say, okay, well, how do you confine, or what kind of matter does this fusion occur in, right? And it occurs in extreme states of matter called plasmas. And we happen to be at the Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory, so folks are probably familiar with this, but plasma is the fourth state of matter, right? We're familiar with the first three. We can take H2O as an example. Solid H2O is, is ice. If you add heat, then you get water. You add more heat, you get steam. If you add a lot more heat, like temperature of the sun, heat, then you get a, a plasma. And a plasma is a superheated gas that's broken down into positive and negative charges. And um, you can control it via uh, magnetic or electric and electric field, and you can confine it in different ways. And fusion occurs in the plasma state. So if Confining a plasma hotter than the sun's core is so difficult. Why do we even bother, right? What's this thing? This sounds pretty hard. I'd rather just go get a battery or something. You know, what's the big deal? Well, as it turns out, fusion, the fusion process is incredibly fuel efficient. So what I'm showing here is a kilometer cubed of water. So one kilometer, one kilometer, one kilometer of seawater, H2O. The fusion fuel contained in that kilometer cubed of seawater would produce energy equivalent to the to the world's entire world's energy uh, oil reserves. So in a kilometer cubed of water, you have the entire world's energy reserves, oil reserves rather. So it's a very efficient process. And if we can harness that process, then we can have a near limitless supply of, of energy. How are we gonna do this? Well, there's three ways to control a fusion plasma. Uh, one that we've talked about, which is gravitational confinement. Another way to control plasma is magnetic confinement. Um, and folks here may be familiar with um, tokamaks, accelerators, and other magnetic confinement devices. And today we're going to talk about the third kind of confinement, which is inertial confinement. And that's the kind of confinement we do at the National Ignition Facility, or the NIF. Inertial confinement, as the name suggests, is when we confine that hot gas that's like the temperature of the sun using inertia. So the inertia of a very heavy um, shell compresses that hot gas as it wants to expand. There's three ingredients for indirect drive inertial confinement fusion. One we've talked about are lasers. The other two ingredients we saw in that movie, um, one is what's called a whole ROM and it's just a German word for empty room. Um, and it's essentially a, a gold cylinder. 
And then the third ingredient is a fuel capsule. And in this small capsule is where the deuterium and tritium, um, we, we pump the deuterium and tritium, and in there is where the fusion occurs. And you can get a sense of scale here. So the lasers um, are in a, a house in a building that's about 160 meters wide. And these targets are you know, a, a millimeter or less. And so there's a big scale difference between the driver for these reactions and the size scale of, of the reaction. And we'll look at each one individually here. So this is the National Mission Facility. We can pop the top off. It's about three football fields big. They're very California-centric football fields, apologize. Um, but each, each component of the facility has a purpose. And we looked at kind of where the lasers start and they go through the laser beam line and they progress to what's called the target chamber. And it's 10 meters in diameter, about 30 feet. And we can get a closer look at that. And this is a photo of the target bay right outside the target chamber. This blue sphere for reference is about 30 feet in diameter. Um, this scene or this kind of perspective was actually in um, Star Trek Into Darkness. Um, they, they made this the warp core of the Enterprise because it looked very scientific. So now, several years ago, we had a bunch of actors running around in front of, in front of the, <laughs> the fusion facility. So, um, but we can, we can take a look inside of the target chamber. And what you're seeing here is the inside of that vacuum vessel. And the way we conduct experiments is we stick these long metal arms in through holes in the side of that vacuum vessel. Um, some of these arms contain measurement devices so we can measure what's going on in the experiment. This particular arm contains the target um, and we can zoom in on that target. One component is this whole ROM, and um, it's about the size of your eye, so it's about a centimeter tall. Uh, and its uh, its purpose is basically to convert the lasers into X-ray energy, and that X-ray energy then becomes the driver for nuclear fusion. Inside that gold cylinder is a capsule. Um, inside inside the whole ROM is a capsule, and that contains the deuterium and tritium fuel. Um, the capsule is about the size of um, FDR's chin here, two millimeters in diameter. Here's a, a dime for scale. And in fact, we take that capsule and we compress it um, about 35 times. And so it goes from being about two millimeters down to being less than the diameter of a human hair. And that occurs in about a nanosecond, a, a billionth of a second. So those are the three ingredients for um, inertial confinement fusion. And um, within the capsule is where we create kind of a small star. Uh, and we can kind of look at the target chamber again. And if we get a closer look at the target here, um, here's an example of one of the um, targets that we use to create fusion. And here's the gold cylinder where the lasers come in the top and the bottom and outside around the cylinder is kind of a shield. Um, and inside is that small capsule. There's some arms. And then over here, there's a, a kind of a cooling, um, copper cooling junction. And um, keep in mind this copper cooling junction and then all the superstructure and, and kind of intricate detail that, that is past that. When we do an experiment, um, the target chamber looks something like this. This is an actual shot time photograph of um, here's the target now, and these are those arms sticking into the target chamber. And after the experiment, this is what's left of the target. So there's there's nothing past that copper cooling arm. It all gets vaporized either by the instant laser energy or by the now the fusion um, energy that's released during these reactions. And I actually I work with the folks who who make these targets, and they're all handmade. Um, and so I, I've asked them, hey, you know, you spend days or weeks making these targets and then we blow them up. How does, how, how is, how do you keep doing that? And um, their reply was quite, you know, insightful. They said, well, we don't view our product as the target. We view it as the knowledge you gained from the experiment because without our work, you couldn't do your, your experiments. And I thought, boy, that's an interesting perspective. <laughs> so, um, so that's an example of, um, of, the target and kind of the process. And let's look at kind of step-by-step step what goes on in inertial confinement fusion. So 
um, to start with, the lasers deposit energy into this whole ROM. There's, that creates a bath of X-rays as the whole ROM gets hotter and hotter, and those X-rays impinge on this capsule that holds its fusion fuel. The capsule surface starts to vaporize or ablate, and as that material comes shooting off um, outwards, Newton's law right, says there's an equal and opposite reaction inwards. And so that drives the capsule inwards you know, at, at a moderate rate, not too fast, about a million miles an hour. So it shoots inwards. It's kind of like a rocket. Um, and as it accelerates inwards, the gas inside heats up. So it converts the kinetic energy of that sh imploding shell into internal um, thermal energy. And that's how it heats up that gas. Remember, a plasma is a superheated gas. It heats that gas up to temperatures hotter than the sun, and that's when fusion can occur. Um, during the introduction, uh, I think Andrew mentioned I was part of the implosion and stagnation group, and this is where those terms come from, right? So implosion is when um, that shell is compressing. We, we hear about explosions oftentimes, but implosion is just when something compresses very rapidly. And stagnation is the instant where the pressure that's um, inward from that drive matches the outward pressure of the fusion. And things stagnate or stop in that instant is that's the instant between things compressing and things exploding. And so um, part of the physics research that I do is the investigation of implosions and stagnation in this process. We saw this in the movie. We're kind of going through the movie step by step here to try to understand the physics of it. So, so this is what we were just talking about. Here's the, the capsule, uh, sorry, here's the whole ROM with the capsule in the middle. X-rays get generated from the lasers ablating the wall. Um, it drives uh, the capsule inwards very rapidly. Things ablate off the shell like a rocket and um, it compresses and makes, um, makes fusion happen. Okay, so we've talked about NIF's mission, we've talked about lasers, we've talked about fusion, we've talked about inertial confinement fusion. What about ignition? Wasn't that in the title of the talk? So what is ignition? Ignition is when the output energy from fusion is greater than the input energy from the laser. And so um, recently, this was the first time that we've ever done this on Earth. And on December 5th, 2022, the National Ignition Facility demonstrated fusion ignition in the laboratory for the first time. And I'll see if I can play this movie. This is um, Secretary Granholm of the Department of Energy talking this about these results. A great day. Uh, today, we're here to talk about fusion, combining two particles into one. Last week at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in California, Scientists at the National Ignition Facility achieved fusion ignition. And that is creating more energy from fusion reactions than the energy used to start the process. It's the first time it has ever been done in a laboratory anywhere in the world. Simply put, this is one of the most impressive scientific feats of the 21st century or as the president might say, right? <laughs> I do think he probably did say this is a BFD. <laughs> Researchers at Livermore and around the world have been working on this moment for more than 60 years. So what does this accomplishment do? Two things. First, it strengthens our national security because it opens a new realm for maintaining a safe, secure, and effective nuclear deter deterrent in an age where we do not have nuclear testing. Ignition allows us to replicate for the first time certain conditions that are found only in the stars and the sun. And the second thing it does, of course, is that this milestone moves us one significant step closer to the possibility of zero carbon, abundant fusion energy powering our society. 
If we can advance fusion energy, we could use it to produce clean electricity, uh, transportation fuels, power heavy industry, so much more. It would be like adding um, a power drill to our toolbox in building this clean energy economy. So today we tell the world that America has achieved a tremendous scientific breakthrough, one that happened because we invested in our national labs and we invested in fundamental research. And tomorrow we'll continue to work toward a future that is powered in part by fusion energy. Pretty impressive. I mean, she is our boss, so take that, bear that in mind. <laughs> but this is as, a great as she day. Said, um, we achieved fusion ignition on uh, December 5th, 2022. I happen to be involved in that. So, kind of give you the inside scoop a little bit. So, on NIF, you do experiments 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It takes hours for these experiments to be set up, for all the lasers to be aligned, all the targets and all those arms to be put in and precisely positioned. And so when the shot is ready, you take the shot. You don't say, oh, I'm coming in at 930. Can you just hold on for a couple hours? So this experiment um, happened at one in the morning on a Monday. And uh, my role at the National Mission Facility is I'm the lead scientist for nuclear diagnostics. So I'm quite interested in the results. So I called up the lead experimentalist, Alex, um, at about 11 o'clock at night, 10.30, 11, and said, hey, Alex, how's it going? It's going okay. Anything interesting happening? No, not yet. Okay, well, call me if anything interesting happens. I'm going to bed. Okay. So at 1.30, Alex calls me up. Hey, Dave. Yep. I think something interesting happened. Okay. So we start looking at the data, and it's 2 in the morning in the dark in my living room, and we're looking at the first results from NIF, and we think we got ignition. And what happened is from that phone call at two in the morning and on a Monday through to the following Tuesday, so not the day after, but eight days later, when the Secretary of Energy announced to the world that we got ignition for the first time, there was a sprint of data analysis to indisputably confirm that ignition was achieved, right? Because this is something that you need to say, okay, we verified this, we verified it again, we verified it again. We made absolutely sure this is, this is the case. So how did we do that? Well, on each experiment, dozens of diagnostics or measurement tools are fielded, and they inform us about what's going on in the experiment. And I'm showing just a couple of those here where we can measure the fusion yield and how uniform the implosion is. So remember that dense shell that gets compressed? Um, you would like it to be totally spherical and, and round, but sometimes it's thicker on the sides than on the top or on the bottom than on the top. We can measure how long that fusion reaction takes. Um, this is an example showing it takes about 100 trillionths of a second to, to evolve, right? It's very quick. Um, and we can look at the neutron spectra, the energy spectrum that's coming off of the plasma, um, the temperature, the density, um, how fast these ions are, and um, bulk motion of the plasma is moving. It's about um, up to 0.1% the speed of light. It's very quick. And in fact, um, one of the diagnostics that we use to verify that we achieve ignition is called an activation diagnostic. And basically it's just a piece of metal that neutrons hit and it activates um, the, a nuclear the radioactive state within that material. And then you can take that material out and measure how radioactive it is. And when you do that, you know how many neutrons hit it because it's precisely calibrated. But you have to wait a couple of days to make that measurement. So you can imagine folks are a little eager to get the data. And so we, we proceeded exactly how we would with any other shot and everything was kind of the, the same uh, methodology and the same analysis. Halfway through that week, um, Wednesday morning, I think, uh, my boss's boss called up and said, hey, I think it'd be a good idea to have external people review this. And so I got on the phone to somebody who had retired, who'd been to the lab for 20 years and said, hey, could you round up some people? He called some people across the country. And so we had a team of experts review the data in those two or three days between when we got the experiment to when we had a press conference in Washington, DC, um, to, to independently verify, yep, this is the first, um, the first experiment to achieve ignition or more energy out from fusion than it took to start the reaction. 
So here's a little summary of, of that event. On December 5th, um, we achieved ignition. Uh, we delivered two megajoules of laser energy to a target, and we created a plasma that produced three megajoules of energy. So how much, what's, what's the relative gain? It's about three over two or like one and a half. So it's more significantly more than one. And this met the National Academy of Sciences definition of fusion ignition. And really it was a result of many decades of passion, work and learning. Um, here's a little um, schematic. So back in the fifties, John Knuckles first conceived of inertial confinement fusion. And then through the subsequent decades after the laser was invented, Livermore um, built and then implemented and then um, improved on a series of lasers that culminated essentially in the National Ignition Facility um, starting to be built. It turned on in 2009. And then there was about a decade of NIF experiments that really laid the groundwork of, um, of science and understanding for today's ignition regime. And since the first ignition result on December uh, 5th, 2022, we've repeated it three times now. And so we're getting more consistent in the understanding and the performance that we can get from these fusion reactants. And in fact, um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we did another experiment. This one happened at 4.40 in the morning. I was the principal investigator, so I was up already looking at the data. Um, and in, in fact, we got um, a gain greater than two on this experiment. And so we can add that to our little chart here. I kind of stole this and added a little more animation at the end. But uh, right, so now we're at kind of a gain greater than two, which again is the first time in the world. And we're headed towards kind of a, a higher gain, which will allow us to get net energy out. I want to talk a little bit about this idea of gain and what that means. So here we have a schematic of the target with the gold cylinder and the capsule containing the fusion fuel. What we talk about is target gain. And so target gain is the energy produced from the fusion or the yield over the energy of the laser. And here's a plot of the gain uh, versus this kind of confinement parameter. And there's uh, some years laid out on this plot. And as we've progressed from 2014, um, we've progressed through different gain metrics up to a gain greater than or equal to one uh, in 2022. And over the course of the decade, since this is a log scale plot, so each of these tick marks is a factor of 10, um, we've increased the gain by approximately 5,000 times. I will note um, that target gain greater than one is not net energy gain. Right? So there's a difference here. Um, it, it depends how you define gain. So you can imagine um, you say, okay, my car, my electric car or whatever is, is pretty carbon free. So I don't, I don't generate carbon, but there was a footprint for making that car, right? So it depends how far back you go in the history of something to say, okay, well, what's the net impact of this? Similarly with, with gain, you can say, okay, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna evaluate the fusion energy out over the laser energy in, but how much electricity do you use to make the laser? And so the next step is making that process more efficient so that we can get to gains, we can get to target gains of 10 to 100, in which case we have net electricity output, which is the idea for a transient power plant. Uh, I'm gonna skip this chart in the interest of time. Um, so part of the um, impact of ignition is that it provides an impetus and a scientific foundation for inertial fusion energy. And that's the idea of taking this process and making a, a energy power plant from that. And so with that, I'll leave this slide up and just, um, this is a new graphic, the National Ignition Facility, because we got ignition. Um, we put the I back in ignition, National Ignition Facility, and thank you. I know you said I was going to take questions, but I'm going to turn it around on people who are leaving now. I said I would come back to this, and I meant it. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to pass out microphones. Uh, we've got them coming down both aisles. If you just raise your hand. And 
if we could stop sharing on Zoom so I could see uh, if anyone raised their hand on Zoom. And we'll just go from there. Okay. Uh, first question is right to your left. Dave. Yeah. Go ahead. Hi, thank you very much for a very informative talk. Um, two, two quick things. Uh, you said like about two megajoules of energy is going in through from the lasers, right? Can you give us an idea what two megajoules is in, I don't know, light bulbs? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. So um, two megajoules is, uh, so, so megajoules is energy. Um, and the thing about energy and power is that if you have a fair amount of energy over a short amount of time, it's a lot of power. So it's going to sound underwhelming when I tell you what two megajoules is. Two megajoules is maybe like a Twinkie and a half of energy. So it's, it's, not, it's not that much energy, but when you do it over a nanosecond, it becomes a, you know, 100 terawatts of power, which is 10 to 100 times the entire US electricity grid. So the two megajoules of energy in is, is um, delivered over such a short amount of time, it's a huge amount of power. Um, and the idea for a fusion power plant, you may be saying, well, okay, why don't you use Twinkies for a power plant? But what we would do is repeat this 10 to or more times a second. And so you'd be churning these out very rapidly and producing um, net energy. Other side of the auditorium, uh, up in the back. Yeah. For a lecture. Um, uh, all the 192 laser, they have the same wavelength. Mm -hmm. And what, what is the wavelength? 1052. Uh, in the middle. Oh, I will say though too. Sorry, I'm, gonna, I'm the king of the king of the long form answer. So um, I will say too that they start out as 1052 nanometers, which is in the near infrared. But before they go into the the target chamber, they get frequency tripled, so the wavelength gets um, decreased by a third. And why would we do that? Well, we've found that the lasers interact with the plasma. So the oscillations in the laser wavelengths um, react with the particles in the plasma. And at that smaller wavelength, there's less loss in that plasma medium. So we convert down in wavelengths to improve the efficiency. Uh, middle, last row. Yeah. If, if um, you had a reaction that wasn't circular, could you aim the the stuff like basically i'm thinking if you're doing fusion for a rocket could you have the energy coming out like going out the back basically could it be directed you mean like could we direct the energy output right right like you you said you were trying to make it more circular um could you do the opposite basically <laughs> i like the way you think <laughs> yeah right so so there are examples um where we see the output, the energy output is non-uniform in space. And there's some ways we can direct it. Um, I don't know if this, I don't think this scheme would be that efficient or effective as like a rocket um, booster, but there are other fusion schemes that are um, more effective at that and actually are being designed for that. Um, there's things that are called like Z-pinches or flow stabilized Z-pinches that are becoming um, kind of viable rocket-based um, fusion plants. Uh, to your left in the first row. Yeah. So there's a thing called antimatter. So is that, would that be 100% energy density compared to fusion? It, you mean like the annihilation of antimatter? Yes. Yeah. yeah, right. So that's converting that entire um, particle into energy. Okay. And also, and oftentimes you, it combines with matter. And that's how it. You use deuterium and tritium, right? Mm -hmm. But I know some fusion uses helium 3. Is How much difference is there? That's a great question. Yeah. So, so in fact, in kind of the framework of stars, right? So stars actually burn through lots of different fusion fuels. And they start with hydrogen. Hydrogen is the lightest element. Um, and deuterium is two isotopes of hydrogen. And we pick um, hydrogen, uh, sorry, we pick deuterium and tritium because it has the highest probability of interacting and, and fusing. Helium-3 also produces fusion. It's harder to do. It's several orders of magnitude uh, more difficult. 
But as you progress through a stellar life cycle, you do burn through helium. Um, you get different products out from helium-3 fusion, um, but you would still get energy gain. And there's talks about different fusion fuels that maybe don't produce a neutron, but instead produce a charged particle. And if you have a charged particle production, you might have an easier time converting that to electricity. And one last thing. So there a couple years ago, there was a research project called Project Icarus, where they were seeing how easy it would be to make a rocket with inertial confinement fusion. Are they still trying to do that? Or did they give up? I have not heard of anything recently on that. Okay. Right? So we have some questions online. Um, Anthony, I'm going to ask in a moment if you could unmute Ava. But uh, Robert Pro Provitz asks, can you get better results if you had 194 lasers instead of 192? <laughs> and then as a follow-on, yeah. with everything we're hearing about artificial intelligence, how, if at all, is artificial intelligence helping inertial confinement fusion? Yeah. So the short answer is yes. With more lasers, we could have um, more output. There's a balance, right? So the more you use to drive the reaction, the more you have to make up to get net electricity out. So adding more drive doesn't necessarily get you a more efficient reaction, but we would get more energy out. And in fact, there's a plan underway to upgrade the National Mission Facility. Um, it will still have 192 lasers, but they'll each be more energetic. So about a factor of um, one and a half times what they are now. And that may occur in the next um, five to seven year time frame. And um, the second question was about artificial intelligence. And yes, so I didn't get into it too much in this talk. Uh, I'm an experimentalist uh, by trade. But on the National Mission Facility, we do about one experiment per day. Um, and these kind of complex experiments take much longer. And so one way to rapidly understand things more is to use machine learning and artificial intelligence. And there's a whole branch of physicists examining, okay, well, how do I model this using um, physics parameters? And then recently people have used artificial intelligence and machine learning to say, can I use a machine learning model to try to optimize parameters and come up with a solution that maybe humans wouldn't be intuitively seeking? Um, to use kind of an uh, artificial intelligence way to, to look at that solution. So that's one way it's used. And Ava, you're on, oh, you're unmuted. Go ahead. Um, can you give an example on how or why fusion ignition would be used as a nuclear deterrent? So, say that again? How, how, what kind of fusion? Um, fusion ignition? Yeah. Right. As a deterrent? Yeah. Yeah, right. That's a good question. So, so did... <laughs> This is going to be a little bit of branch, but deterrent is an interesting word. So um, right now, the nuclear weapons we have are deterrents. We don't need to use them, but they deter people from antagonizing or being aggressors all across the world. And the fact that we achieve fusion ignition is a signal to people to say, hey, we really understand the way these things work. And it deters them from saying, okay, well, they don't really know what's going on. Their stuff is aging. They don't really... You know, they haven't done stuff in 10, 20, 30 years. This, this example of fusion ignition is kind of a signal to say, hey, look, we really understand what's going on. Um, we can use it for fusion energy, and we can also understand um, kind of the processes that govern nuclear weapons. So that's one way that fusion ignition can be seen as a deterrent, a nuclear, de nuclear deterrent. Okay, there's a question right here. Yeah. What are the three ways to control a fusion plasma? Which is the most common and which is the most efficient? Hmm. That's a good, I know, right? <laughs> well, the most common is, is an easy one. That's gravitational confinement, right? So the universe is full of, of examples of gravitational confinement of fusion reactors, right? It's stars, 99% of the universe is plasma. Um, the most efficient, I would say, it remains to be seen. How's that for a, a politic answer? Good political answer. <laughs> yeah, right.
Can you hear me? Yeah. I'm sorry, my question relates to what she's asking. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that inertial confinement has worked better than the electromagnetic confinement. It produced a result that we saw. I wanted to ask what are the positive, I mean, by what does it uh, compare better to the electromagnetic confinement? What's what's better about it and what, yeah. yeah. Right, well, that's a good question, yeah. So, so I, I think it's uh, active area of research, which way is better? Um, Recently, NIF achieved ignition, and that's a scientific milestone. Um, it shows, hey, we can get net energy out. The electro electromagnetic confinement or magnetic confinement has been steadily making progress for decades, and they're actually building several large-scale devices across the world that will aim to get even higher energy output than NIF. So there's an experiment in France that's being built by a seven or larger nation collaboration um, and recently in the U.S., there's been a huge growth in private fusion companies. And a lot of those private companies are the magnetic confinement kind of companies. And so I think we're really at a point where all options are on the table. And it, it's kind of a, a race and interesting to see what's going to come out ahead. There is, yes. There's a magneto inertial fusion category. Yeah. Yes, is it, is it sewing? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think the achievement of NIF uh, is really great. And uh, yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah, the, the uh, NIF ignition experiment is very interesting. Uh, so I've been working in, in magnetic confinement, and uh, I, I wanted to point out that there was an experiment done at in, in England, a joint European experiment that achieved a Q of 0 0.8 so it got close to ignition mm -hmm. so i've studied that experiment in detail and have published a paper showing that if you look at the limit of q in the core it's 1. 1.3 it was 1.3 mm. so in, in one sense they did achieve ignition first <laughs> well I didn't. I didn't see the paper on that. You just send me the reference. <laughs> okay. Uh, in the back row. Uh, there you go. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you. Very interesting presentation. I was. Um, I'm always wowed. Uh, I. I have a question on the commercial application of uh, nuclear fusion. Uh, and the security of it, mm -hmm. because uh, I think what you said is if you have higher laser beams, you can produce more energy. As we start thinking of how we build this out commercially, what are the security or the fail safe um, you know, thought processes to make sure that it's not misused? Mm -hmm. Because I can imagine if you are creating uh, you know, power that's more than the sun, uh, this, this could have... Uh, devastating effect if it's not controlled mm -hmm. yeah right so that's a that's a really great question and um right now we have nuclear power that's fission um and the thing about fission is it's an a, like a runaway process once you start it it kind of avalanches and um that if not controlled can lead to meltdowns fusion on the other hand has been really hard to do and so um there's not much risk of Kind of things running away or or becoming um, uncontrollable. If if things, for example, if something doesn't quite work with the confinement here, it just kind of doesn't produce energy and kind of fizzles out. On the magnetic fusion side of things, um, there are rapid disruptions or um, things like that, but there isn't really a nuclear risk at all um, from nuclear fusion power plants. Um, the lasers and that kind of infrastructure, I think, is Kind of complicated enough that there isn't too much um, bad actors that would go out and use them. So. I'm going to combine a couple of questions online uh, from Cody Volinger and from Joe Gornaccia. Sorry if I butchered your name, Joe. Um, so these two questions are first, how much energy went into producing the laser energy? One. And then two, if this is successful, could you sort of describe what does a the next generation ignition facility look like? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, so so one thing about the National Ignition Facility is um, it was built in, it was started to be built in the 2009, 2000, well, early 2000s, 
And so it's built on 1990s technology. So there's much more efficient ways to make the laser. Um, at the moment, it takes about 300 megajoules to make the two megajoules of laser energy. And so if you want to talk about wall plug efficiency, we're still several orders of magnitude away from having net electricity output. Um, a next generation facility would solve some of that, right? So we've advanced a little bit in our science since 30 years ago. We can now make those kinds of lasers with uh, more, instead of 1% or 0.1% efficiency, it's more like 20%. So we gain an order of magnitude back. Um, for a fusion power plant, uh, right now we do one of these shots and it takes a day to do. We would need to do 10 of these in a second. So it's a phenomenal leap in the repetition rate of doing these experiments. So a next generation facility would start to probe and, and look at some of those next level challenges that we have to do to, to get net electricity out. Uh, in the back, last row, and then we have another question coming. Yes, no, yeah. yeah. Hi. Uh, so you mentioned you do 10 in a second uh, of those um, ignitions, but every time the target is destroyed. So how do you do? So the yeah. first question and the second one, if I can, is, um, is there any roadmap uh, timeline when you think, or like lab, lab thinks that there will be a um, power factory? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, those are two excellent questions. So um, one scheme for repeat, repeating this 10 times a second, instead of having these big metal arms that go in and hold these targets, you would shoot them in essentially with a big pipe. And so you just shoot targets into a large chamber 10 times a second. So you're, you, some cars now have internal combustion engines with fuel injectors that inject fuel every so often. It's kind of a similar um, concept with a inertial fusion power plant where you'd inject fuel or targets 10 times a second. And then your laser would pulse on and, and create fusion 10 times a second. And that fusion process is very quick. And so you would create the fusion, factuate the gas and shoot in another target. So that would be kind of the, the way to field those targets very rapidly. Um, and I've forgotten your second question. Roadmap. roadmap, yes, a roadmap, yes. So, I, and Andrew and other folks who are familiar with this field can weigh in, but I think it's a really phenomenal time to be involved in fusion because as far as a roadmap, it seems there's there's highways, there's side streets, there's you know kind of me, medium-sized roads that people are driving down, partly through the advent of, or the um, onset of private companies who are investing in fusion energy. And some of them have roadmaps that are very short so in the next three to five years, say, I think that's very ambitious. I think it's phenomenal to try that. Um, for inertial fusion energy, I think it would be on the scale decades, um, but I, I believe it'd be in our lifetime. Eat healthy, you know, get lots of exercise. <laughs> There's a question right here. Um, my question is during the process of preparing to hit the target, what makes the lasers more energetic? Yeah, so um, a couple things. One is um, as the lasers pass through the beam line, they get amplified up by that process. So they start out as like a laser pointer like this. Oops, I keep hitting the wrong button. Laser pointer, but they get amplified up in a billion times as they pass through this um, laser glass. But then as they go towards the target, like you like you mentioned, they get focused down to very small spots. So you can think about, you know, if you have a flashlight and it's just flashing light out into the room, but if you focus it down, it becomes a lot brighter. And in fact, the lasers on NIF, um, we keep them so large because if they pass through glass, they would just break it at, at their smallest point. So as the laser beams move towards the target, they get focused down to um, about, uh, 10 millionths to 1 millionth of a meter. So very, thousands of a, of a millimeter, very, very small. And those make them very intense sources of, of laser light. Uh, Ray here uh, by Arturo. Uh, uh, I had a question. You mentioned how it would be orders of magnitude harder to change to like a helium isotope while doing a fusion reaction. As fusion technology develops, 
do you see any like uh, value in switching to another isotope uh, such as helium? Yes. <laughs> yes, and I, yes, I, I was being a little glib, but yeah, and I, I uh, and other colleagues have said this, but I, I think from my perspective, we're kind of at the stage of like either the Wright brothers you can compare it to, where we're, we're building an airplane that didn't look anything like a 747, right? But but they had something that worked, and so we're at the stage in fusion now where we're saying, okay, we're trying to get something that works. We're using a fuel that's easy, but as we move towards more sophisticated and developed implementations. Some of those advanced fuels are more efficient. Some of those advanced fuels don't have neutrons flying out that would make things radioactive. Um, some of them have fuels that are even more readily available. And so there is an advantage to moving to those advanced fuels. Where do we get helium-3 readily from? Oh, it would be helium-3? Yeah. Uh, I think that's what he's asking, right? Oh, yeah. That right. would be that would be a little difficult, I think. Right. Yeah. Um, like boron, put on boron or something right. like that. Uh, up in the back. Uh, in Cataras, uh, I know that uh, they are building a prototype for 500 megawatt uh, power uh, for an industrial application that is going on, and uh, instant plasma physics also has taken part on that. Can you tell uh, what uh, method they are using and what is the status of that project? Do you know, is that general, general fusion? fusion? Is that general fusion? general fusion? Yeah, so, and other folks could weigh in, but my understanding is um, it's kind of a hybrid configuration. So general fusion uses, um, compresses the plasmas, but they use mechanical compression. So they have these large pistons that compress the fuel to very high um, densities and temperatures. And that's how they, they make the fusion happen. So the, uh, that will be, as a matter of fact, is a replacement for nuclear uh, fusion, uh, fission. So it will be, they are trying to do a commercial application for 500 megawatt generation. Yep, yep. And that's the event. There's, as I said, it, it's an interesting time to be in fusion because there's a lot of different directions. The traditional direction for fusion power plants, either magnetic confinement, inertial confinement, is to make a power plant on the gigawatt scale. So 500 megawatts to a gigawatt and replace a fission power plant, which would be interesting because it'd be a drop-in replacement for a large scale power plant. Um, there's also talk of making small fusion reactors that could go on the back of a semi, semi uh, trailer, tractor trailer truck. I think we have time for two more questions. And then of course, if anyone wants to come down afterwards, you're welcome to. So we'll go there. And then... uh, hi, uh, I had a question on, uh... You, you were you were talking about shooting these targets to the lasers. So how does the sun do it? How does the sun evolve? Uh, uh, you, and then you, when you were speaking, you, you were saying the sun burns heavier and heavier materials. So is that what's the process? Is it burning first hydrogen, then helium, and sort of going up? Uh, how, and how do they die out then? So can you, do you can you explain how that happens? Sorry, I I got I didn't quite understand. So, so for a uh, power plant, we shoot it multiple times. Yeah, but stars... uh, in the sun, how is it happening? Yeah, uh, but, and how is it yeah, happening yeah. over millions of years? Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Right. So, um, the way stars work is, as we said, gravitational confinement. So they start with hydrogen, and hydrogen fuses together and produces helium, and then they fuse helium, and and that progresses to heavier and heavier elements. They don't shoot more targets in, but the products of each previous fusion reaction become the fuel for the next reaction. So they um, start fusing heavier and heavier elements and there's a curve that describes the energy you can get out of fusion reactions and it ends at iron. And so once fusion, once stars start to get close to or are burning elements that are near iron, they, they start to lose the um, pressure, the out, outward pressure from the fusion and their own gravity collapses them. And they can follow several different paths of, of stars dying. So that's kind of the evolution of, of stars moving through fusion fuels. Thank you. Yeah. And then our last question is right here in front. Well, congrats on achieving the, the net energy gain of five just a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> and if I remember the chart correctly, the last one was like three or something. So mm -hmm. what do you attribute that to? And then you know, what are your personal sort of prediction next year or two on the continued progression of the net gains? Mm -hmm. Was it, what do I attribute the increase to? Is that the first part of the question? 
Yeah, just, uh, yeah. What, what, are, what are the explanations for that? Yeah. It's a very significant gain from three to five. Yes, yeah. Okay, well, let me start my next 45 minute lecture. I'm just gonna stop. <laughs> yeah, so there, there's a slew of different um, adjustments that we made for this recent shot. And the components that we've been talking about for this, this presentation, the that capsule, the gold cylinder, the lasers, we've adjusted all of those um, according to models and, and analytic theory to, to improve the confinement. For this particular experiment, what we did is we increased the thickness of the capsule. And so as that capsule compresses, there is more confinement of the plasma. You need more energy to drive it in. But once you get ignition, that burn, that burning star um, is better confined. And so it self heats and propagates the, fuel, the fusion burn even more. Um, and so that's one reason why we increased from 3.8 to uh, 5 megajoules this last time. Um, and then the next kind of steps going forwards. NIF is, NIF is a, uh, and lasers in general are um, fairly expensive. And so at the moment, what we're trying to do is become more efficient. And so over the next couple of years, what we're really doing is driving towards the science understanding and improving the efficiency of the process. There's a longer term plan to have more energy and more drive lasers. But in the meantime, what we are aiming towards is to try to get 10-ish megajoules. So go from five to 10 in the next year or two, and then eventually get to 20 megajoules is what the models predict in the next five-ish years, next six years. Yeah, right. And if we could give a big round of applause one more time. Thank you, Dr. Sarsberg.